Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Annalise Skoger, and I'm a Rubenstein Fellow here at the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program. Dr. Richard Reeves and I are really excited to bring you this event today, where we'll invite some of the most committed voices on expanding apprenticeship throughout the country uh, to talk about the business case for expanding apprenticeships. This is a very timely conversation because on February 5th, the US House of Representatives passed the National Apprenticeship Act of 2021. This act, if enacted, would provide a lot of support to expand apprenticeships beyond the trades where they have been successful for decades, but also provide more inclusion and diversity within the existing system. In the US, we've spent most of our public education investments in trying to send everyone to college. But the problem with this is we haven't been very successful at this. And we're also leaving a lot of people behind. We're leaving behind people who can't afford to go to college or to take on a lot of student debt. And I can relate to this as a first generation college graduate who's still struggling to pay down my college debt. We're also leaving behind people who like to learn with their hands, learn, with their, um, learn by doing. And people who are like my father who learned woodworking in high school and enjoyed the creativity of being able to build things. And finally, we're leaving behind a lot of employers who are looking for a mix of skills that balance somebody who ha has some basic fundamentals from the classroom, but also has some experience um, learning the specific equipment they have or solving the types of problems that are specific to their industry. In the United States, about a third of Americans actually have a college degree, which means that for two thirds of Americans, we don't have many options for them to get access to a quality job, except to say, go back to college. Apprenticeship offers an alternative to this because apprenticeship blends a structured education um, opportunity over the long term with paid on the job learning opportunities under the close supervision of a mentor. A lot of people often ask, what's the difference between an apprenticeship and an internship? So I'll share a quick example. Let's say you're an, an intern at a winery and you might spend your day cleaning up after a tasting or stocking some bottles. It might be good for some networking, but it ends in a few months. On the other hand, a viticulture apprentice would spend many years working under the wings of an experienced winemaker and by the end is basically a winemaker themselves. This is what apprenticeship can do. The COVID-19 situation has actually uh, made this situation much more acute, not only because of the mass layoffs that we're seeing across the country, but because these layoffs have particularly affected America's youth. And we've learned from previous recessions that an early stage disruption in someone's career can have long-term impacts on their earnings and career outcomes. So there's really no time like the present that we could have this conversation about how to provide more options for people to access quality jobs and a family sustaining wage. One of the biggest barriers to expanding apprenticeship beyond the trades is that outside of that narrow set of sectors, um, a lot of employers that aren't really familiar with apprenticeship, don't know really how to get started and don't know what the costs and benefits are. The conversation today hopefully will shed some light on this. In addition, a lot of the ecosystem actors, such as industry associations, community colleges, workforce boards, and community organizations, often help reduce the costs for employers, especially small and medium-sized employers that can't take on the full cost of starting a program from scratch themselves. And this bill, the National Apprenticeship Act of 2021, will take a lot of steps to help enhance that ecosystem and go beyond just the patchwork of things that we have right now. Another thing that we're gonna hear a lot today about, I hope, will be how to be intentional about inclusion and diversity within apprenticeship. Registered apprenticeship currently doesn't have a great track record. Um, for example, about 88% of apprentices are male. And so as we talk about expanding apprenticeship, we have to figure out how to be intentional about what elements will actually help increase access for people who may be very talented, but are often very, are overlooked in the regular hiring process. 
A few quick housekeeping items before we get started. If you have any questions, you can tweet them at hashtag expand apprenticeships. And this event is going to be recorded and posted on the Brookings event website. So you can share that. And also my colleagues and I just released a brand new FAQ for employers on apprenticeships. And this is also available on the brookings.edu website. It is now my great honor to introduce Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, a fierce advocate for quality jobs and childcare, among other issues, and one of the co-sponsors of the National Apprenticeship Act of 2021. Welcome, Congresswoman Bonamici. Well, thank you so much, Annalise, and thank you to Brookings for inviting me to join you today for this very timely discussion about how to expand registered apprenticeships and how to best support workers during and after the pandemic. In my home state of Oregon, and I wanna say Annalise, I appreciated the viticulture example, uh, and around the country, registered apprenticeships, pre-apprenticeships, and youth apprenticeships are helping workers access employment. And they're particularly helping people with barriers to employment. This is even more important at a time when millions of people are out of a job because of the coronavirus pandemic, and as significant sectors of our economy are on the verge of transformation. The way I like to look at it is having a path for everyone. Right now, working families are struggling, facing uncertainty, economic hardship, anxiety about the future. According to the Department of Labor, approximately 4 million people are now classified as long-term unemployed after being out of work for more than six months. And that total is likely an undercount. Recent reports have suggested that as many as 7 million jobs may not return to the labor market after the pandemic. Many unemployed individuals will need meaningful upskilling and reskilling opportunities to reenter the workforce, and many workers who are currently employed will need additional training as the future of work evolves. Registered apprenticeships are often life-changing opportunities, especially for women, people of color, and other workers who have historically faced barriers to employment. Last summer, I held a roundtable discussion, virtual of course, with apprentices, pre-apprentices, and union leaders from across Northwest Oregon. And I spoke with apprentices like Lacey. She said, I don't know where I would be or what I would be doing without her apprenticeship. She was with local, uh, Labor's Local 737. And Lacey said, it made it possible to pay my bills and feed my kid. Now, Lacey's story is just one example of many registered apprenticeships are paid on the job training opportunities with a 94% employment rate upon completion and an average annual salary of more than $75,000. More importantly, registered apprenticeships also provide workers with the support services they need to succeed, like tools, work attire, transportation, childcare, and importantly, mentoring opportunities. So in the coming months, Congress is gonna be crafting a recovery package to build back better with a specific focus on creating infrastructure um, that's manufacturing and clean energy jobs. So infrastructure, manufacturing, and clean energy jobs. There's a lot of potential there. The transition to a clean energy economy will create a demand for more workers. And there is already an unmet need for skilled workers workers in the energy efficiency sector. Last year, I visited with apprentices at the IBEW Local 48 in Portland, Oregon. So they have a partnership with NECA, the National Electrical Contractors Association. And the IBEW's electrical apprenticeship program just demonstrates how our transition to a clean energy economy provides an extraordinary opportunity to create good paying jobs. So efforts at the NECA IBEW Local 48 Electrical Apprenticeship Training Program, it's a mouthful, but it's a great example of why we need to protect and strengthen our registered apprenticeship system. As a senior member of the Education and Labor Committee, I frequently advocate for workers and students who need our help and support. So earlier this year, as you heard, I joined Congressman Scott in co-leading the Bipartisan National Apprenticeship Act to create nearly 1 million new registered apprenticeships youth apprenticeships and pre-apprentices apprenticeships over the next five years. Our bill invests three and a half billion dollars to scale up apprenticeship opportunities, to streamline access to apprenticeships for workers and employers, and importantly, to expand apprenticeships into new in-demand industry sectors and occupations. 
Industry, par industry partnerships are a helpful tool in scaling up registered apprenticeships. And I have an example, the Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center, or OMIC in Northwest Oregon, is bringing together industry leaders with educational institutions, including Oregon Institute of Technology, Oregon State University, Portland State University, Portland Community College, to develop a registered apprenticeship program in advanced manufacturing. So my Bipartisan Partners Act, which is included in the National Apprenticeship Act, is modeled on the efforts at OMIC to help small and medium-sized businesses develop registered apprenticeships. The bill supports industry partnerships that bring together employers, education, training, labor, community-based organizations to create paid on-the-job training programs that meet the needs of employers in the region and provide workers with support services. So last month, the House passed the National Apprenticeship Act with bipartisan support. The bill has strong support in the Biden-Harris administration. And our, our, our uh, expectation is that we hope the Senate will take it up soon. I will keep working with my colleagues on the Education and Labor Committee to support registered apprenticeships so we can get this bill signed into law and implemented. These opportunities provide workers with quality training, portable credentials, high wages, support services, and a pathway to a permanent job. But registered apprenticeships do more than train a workforce. They change lives for the better. So thank you again for inviting me to join you today. I look forward to our continued work together and a great conference. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Bonamici. All really excellent points. And now I'd like to introduce you to Ann S. Kim, contributing editor for Washington Monthly, and she's gonna tell you about our panel. Great, thank you so much, Annalise. Thank you so much, Annalise. Um, I am Ann Kim, I'm a contributing editor at Washington Monthly Magazine, and I have the distinct privilege of moderating a panel featuring some of the uh, employers and thought leaders who have really been out front, thinking about apprenticeship, modernizing the model, and uh, advocating for it. So what they'll be doing is offering some kind of ground level insights about the programs they've created. And as the title of this session suggests, making the business case for apprenticeships. If you would like to submit a question to them, uh, you can send an email to events at brookings.edu or you can reach out on Twitter, hashtag expand apprenticeships. So joining me on this panel are Maria Flynn, she is the CEO of the nonprofit Jobs for the Future. Obed Louis Saint, who is a VP for People and Culture at IBM. Vivek Nair, who is the engineering manager at the cloud computing firm Twilio. And Noel Ginsberg, who is the founder of CareerWise Colorado and CEO of Intertech Plastics. So um, if we could begin with Maria, if you could start us off. Uh, Annalise has alluded a little bit to what the post-pandemic future is going to look like, but if you can set the broader context for us, what do you see as the major challenges for businesses and workers, and how does apprenticeship fit in as a strategy for the recovery? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, and just to build on what Annalise uh, said, so we're at this moment where we are marking this one-year anniversary of COVID and the really devastating impact that it has had on our economy and our labor market. And within that context, we know that young people particularly are being um, hit very hard. And to put that in some context, so as of January, the unemployment rate for 16 and 19 year olds was over 14%. So more than double the national unemployment rate. The rate for 20 to 24 year olds was a bit better, but still over one and a half times the national rate. So we know that, you know, within this crisis, there's um, an even kind of more devastating crisis for young people in today's economy. And that comes at a time when our post-secondary institutions or our higher ed system in general is also going uh, through a major disruption uh, due to COVID. And, young people are seeing a lot of competition for jobs that typically, you know, a young person might get. And that's because um, as we see in a lot of economic downturns, you have workers with higher skill levels, with more work experience who are competing for those entry level jobs. So 
those are just you know, a number of reasons why in addition to um, you know, older workers, I think apprenticeship and those really important pre-apprenticeship pathways that the Congresswoman spoke to um, just really make a lot of sense, both for the individual and the employer. And so just five like quick points on why um, I think that this is, you know, an important match, like at a really critical moment for our country. So one is the fact that as an earn and learn model, uh, young people or workers in general are not accumulating debt while they are getting this really critical um, training experience. Second is that, you know, for folks who like, uh, as it was mentioned, to kind of learn by doing, um, it really has that inherent connection between the academic learning and the applied learning. So individuals can really see the relevance to what they're um, learning and how that is applied on the job. Uh, third, it really helps them build a very active and relevant professional network and the social capital that comes along with that. Um, it also gives them that early experience in the workplace. So they are able to build those employability skills that are so important as we move through our careers. And then finally, it also isn't just um, kind of entry into that first job, but apprenticeships can also truly lead to that career advancement. So it is really, you know, the first job and the jobs that come after that as part of this apprenticeship pathway. So I think there's a lot of reasons why it makes sense. And I know we're gonna dig into this more, but I think, you know, a few things that are kind of barriers um, to scaling this more right now, one is funding and the uh, legislation that the Congresswoman mentioned is certainly key to that. Um, as Annalise mentions, in really digging in the diversity, inclusion, and equity component is critical. Um, I think there's issues around clarity. I think you know it is confusing. I think both for employers, but also for workers, on how to find these opportunities and how to kind of take that first step. So a lot to dig into today for sure. Um, Obed, if I can, if I can turn to you. Um, IBM has been out front for a really long time, uh, dealing with some of the challenges that uh, Maria has mentioned, but also you've also seen firsthand the benefits of how apprenticeship uh, plays out. Can you talk a little bit about why IBM um, opted so early on to embrace apprenticeship as a model for its human capital development and how it fits into the company's vision of what the jobs of the future are going to look like? Or, um, first of all, thank you so much for facilitating this panel. Um, it is a, uh, what an important topic, and, and we feel privileged to be able to speak about our experience and hopefully share some insight um, that, of things that we've learned and we're continuing to learn. So first, let me start with saying that, look, as a company, we firmly believe that organizations that are deploying um, market changing uh, technologies have a responsibility to one, um, prepare people for the way the technologies will reshape jobs. And in second is ensuring that economic opportunity is created by those innovations is inclusive, right? So it includes everyone. And at the start of this conversation, we talked about um, that individuals with degrees only represent a third of the population. It's about bringing everyone along. We also know that while um, the, the coronavirus has accelerated digital transformation, we also know based on also data that was, uh, I won't recap, but has been already highlighted, has widened the gap between those who have the skills um, and those who don't. Right, so we've got to find ways if we're going to create economic opportunity in an inclusive way to close those particular skills gaps. And we also knew even before the virus, right, is that we had a number of um, jobs in our industry in tech that continue to go unfulfilled, and then we um, and now we have a number of individuals who. Are, are unemployed or do not have access to those jobs. So we have to find ways in which to bridge those particular gaps. So as we're shifting the paradigm with regard to talent, that is the way, one of the ways in which we will help to bridge the gap between, um, uh, between where we need to be and where we are today. So our response to that has been, we coined a new term about five years ago um, around new collar. And it needs our 
and appreciating jobs that are not white collar jobs, not blue collar jobs, but ones that are um, are modern, um, high um, income, also um, good or a wage earning jobs um, so that you can earn a sustainable wage um, and, and continue to grow and benefit from the economic opportunity that's being created. Today in our business, if you would have um, about 50% of our jobs uh, do not require a four year degree. Whereas if you went several years back, about four or five years back, that would have been over 90% of our jobs would have required degrees. So we have um, gone through and then say, what are the real skills that are necessary? And then how do you source for the skills rather than um, um, credentials that are not necessarily necessary? and I have other inherent biases in, in them. Now, 50% of our jobs do require a degree. So people say, well, our degree is not important anymore. Of course they are. They just have a place. So we have to be thoughtful about when we set up um, barriers to entry for jobs and then how do you close those particular gaps. So we learned a number of things. And then I would say in the last several years, we learned namely four things around scaling apprenticeships. So they're so important to now our talent, overall talent portfolio, but as, we, as we've um, deployed them, we learned four things. One is change starts at the top. Um, and as leaders, change is on us to set the tone for how we use and create more equitable pathways. And then so it's not just words, right, but it's action. Um, one of the things that um, our leadership does is we invite individuals who have gone through apprenticeships or our P-TECH program um, into our environment where into our leadership sessions, into conferences to tell their stories so that our leaders can get a clear view of what these individuals are capable of when they're um, um, when they have the right solutions or the right um, services to help them. Second is we have to review our job requirements, right? Um, and in taking out those unnecessary barriers. So hence going from the 90 plus percent to now 50% not requiring four, de four years degree, four year degrees. Um, third is showcasing those amazing stories, right? So we do have to showcase the amazing stories of, and it was so nice to hear some of the stories here. We have our own stories. Um, you know, I, I think about um, Isuri, who's an individual who started, um, she started as an apprentice about two, two years ago, and then she completed the program just last year. And then now she was the first generation to go to, um, so to go to community college as she was going working on her apprenticeship. She also went um, at night to earn her own degree, is now in, um, is a mainframe administrator, so is earning um, a, a, a very good livable wage. I think about a friend of mine, a personal friend of mine, who, um, who was laid off last um, last spring and she was thinking about how to she restart her career as a mid a mid career professional um, and and so while she was in the retail space she started to take some of our courses online around data science and then just yesterday just yesterday it was a beautiful call to get from a friend that says you know what i accepted the ibm apprentice per, um, ship in data science <laughs> um and so she's going to now start her new journey so last year is a you know uh, a uh, over a decade as a, a retail um, uh, uh, professional, it now is starting in data science. So we've got to share those amazing stories so that it helps um, our organization recognize that there is many different ways in which to um, gain and build talent. And then the last of those four things that I call out is building the right wraparound solutions to ensure that the, um, that the, uh, the students, the professionals are successful. That means the right onboarding activities, but it's not enough just at the start, right? Um, providing the right mentors, training those mentors, um, and then having the right levels of check-ins and continuous learning as we go. The average IBMer spends about 80 hours a year learning. Our apprentices are up to like 400, right? So they are earning, they are learning, um, and they are getting digital credentials and bad Edges. And then when we look at teams that have a mix of, you know, our traditional um, uh, degreed uh, recruits, as well as our apprenticeships, our, our P-TECH grad, we see that those teams that have a more rounded um, set of capability and skills, they innovate more. 
They are uh, more inclusive teams. So we are seeing the business value and the benefit um, of these particular programs. Terrific. So IBM is a huge company, um, but Vivek, if we could turn to you, I mean, Twilio has shown that you can be a smaller company and also adopt apprenticeships as a successful model. Can you speak a little bit to that? And also, I want to pull a theme that uh, Obed talked about, which was inclusion. Um, some of the presentations I've seen about Twilio's program talks a lot about improving diversity and using apprenticeship as a means of um, diversifying, especially the tech sector, which hasn't been particularly known for diversity. So if you could touch on that as well. Most definitely. And thank you, and uh, Maria and Obed for your eloquent remarks so far. Um, I'm a lowly practitioner of apprenticeships and I only started doing this about three years ago. And um, I look forward to being on this panel to share what I've learned so far. Um, to your point, um, as a company, Twilio has had a focus on diversity, equity and inclusion for the past many years and we've set uh, broad goals of having 50% of our workforce globally identify as women by the end of 2023. Uh, in the US, having strong representation for underrepresented talent uh, and having folks really feel like they belong at this organization. So let me uh, share my screen and tell you a little bit about Twilio's journey uh, when it comes to apprenticeship and how that takes us towards that goal. Um, so, first of all, a little bit about Twilio. Uh, we're an organization that, as Anne mentioned, is focused on cloud communications, have about 26 offices globally, are at about 5,500 people, uh, our workforce globally. Um, let me tell you more about Hatch. We've been really intentional about Hatch and focusing it as a software engineering apprenticeship for underrepresented individuals from non-traditional backgrounds. In the US, this includes demographics such as uh, gender identity, race, sexual orientation, uh, and many others. And, but more specifically, we've been looking at non-traditional educational and professional backgrounds, such as people who may have had a bootcamp certificate, might have had some college community credit, credit or those who might be self-taught as well. Um, the way we structured this uh, was about six months in duration. Um, the whole point is, as Obed mentioned, creating a really intentional onboarding experience for the first two months, then really embedding the apprentices with strong mentors uh, on teams for another four months. And we're constantly assessing their performance, giving them feedback, really nurturing them with the real intent of converting them to full-time employees. And let me just let the metrics speak for themselves. We've had six cohorts since 2017. Again, we're a small organization, our numbers are small, but we've offered 43 apprenticeships across many teams since then in about six cohorts. And we have a goal of achieving 100 by 2023, which is a significant portion of our workforce. Uh, the success metrics have spoken to our business leaders. 94% of our apprentices have converted to full-time roles in the organization, and another 94% of those continue to be with the company. So it's not just about the number we offer, the number we convert, and the number we retain. It's also about how they grow within the organization. So what we found is that 45% of our apprentices who are eligible for promotion have been able to do that, which is in line with other sources of talent that we've had, such as new college graduates, et cetera. Uh, their, their tenure in that entry level position is about in line with other sources of similar talent. And overall people have a really strong um, opinion of the program after having gone through it. And with specific focus on the diversity, equity and inclusion front, we found that over two thirds of the folks going through the program identify as underrepresented in one or more demographics. More than half the individuals identify as fe female or non-binary. And in most cases, they're bringing some transferable knowledge from previous experience, be it previous lived experience, previous professional experience. And that's the value they bring to the organization in helping us think differently and build better products. Um, and you know, numbers are a little bit dehumanizing. I just want to end 
with my favorite slide, um, which is the partners and the community that helps us find all of this talent. We have local partners like TechSF in San Francisco, uh, DIDO, that's Denver Economic Development and Opportunity in Denver, um, and a few other boot camps. Tech Hire Oakland is another one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and finally, it's the people. At the end of the day, there are 43 stories that we've had come to Twilio and another 57 to come and many more to create. So I just want to end that this really impacts individual lives. These are people who might have otherwise not had an opportunity to work in this industry. And I'm just really excited for um, the doors this opens for many more people to come. Vivek, your last slide with the uh, showing the, the the ecosystem and the community and the network that was created by the apprenticeship program is actually a perfect segue into the question that I want to ask Noel. Um, the organization that you founded, CareerWise, has really revolutionized in many ways that connection between education and career. And I wanna bring up this issue of the skills gap as well, because there has been, a, you know, many employers talk about that mismatch between what students get in school and what workers need on the job. Can you talk about how CareerWise uh, came to be and how apprenticeship kind of fits, is the heart of that model that you've developed in Colorado for creating those connections and building a network out there? Sure, I'd be happy to share with that story. And it really starts actually with how I grew up. You could almost say by luck of birth, I had an apprenticeship because I would go to work with my dad. He was in the food business when I was a young kid, could drive a forklift before I could drive a car. And when I went into university, uh, I had the opportunity to do a business plan and I ended up founding a manufacturing company in my uh, beginning of my senior year and leaving university to run that business full time, although it only had 12 employees because I didn't know how to run a plastics company, I knew early on if I was to be successful, I would have to find talent that knew what I didn't. And manufacturing in Colorado is not a big thing. It's not like the Midwest. So that journey spanned decades of time. Uh, but I knew that talent development would be key to the success of my business. So the first place I went were our schools. Assuming if I didn't have the talent, it was probably because of them. And what I learned is it wasn't the case that over the years, the lack of business engagement in education, not just being consumers of education, but producers as well was fundamental, is the gut instinct that I had. And then second, I was fortunate enough to be a sponsor through the I Have a Dream Foundation of 42 inner city kids from a housing project that had a 90% dropout rate in Denver. And after 10 years of working with those young people, my wife, myself, and later my kids, because they were born during that time, we graduated over 90% of those kids. And it sent me on a journey to find a solution that could scale. It's one thing for 42, but can you do that for city, or state, or country? And that led me to an institute in Switzerland where I learned that 70% of their population had an apprenticeship that started, and this is key, when students were in high school. And that when they graduated, the average starting wage was over $50,000. So I knew the right then that what I'd been looking for for decades existed in another country. What surprised me is it wasn't just about advanced manufacturing or the trades. It was banking and finance. The chairman of UBS started as an apprentice. So I quickly reached out to our governor, Governor Hickenlooper, now Senator Hickenlooper, and asked him to re bring back a delegation. And he did. And because of that, we were able to find to form career-wise just about six months later. We just graduated our first cohort of apprentices that started in their junior year of high school. And so the reason is really twofold. One is there's a growing need for talent in this country. We're not solving the problem. We point the finger at education, whether it be K-12 or higher ed and say, it must be them. And I'm convinced it's not them, it's all of us. And business has a responsibility. So when we form career-wise, we recognize that just starting an organization or apprenticeships within business is not easy. If you don't have the framework, the tools, the technology, the competencies that are trained to, an apprenticeship, a registered apprenticeship model that the USDOL has that can help create credentials across the country, we wouldn't succeed. So we set out on that journey and have now between Colorado and our other affiliates around the country have brought in over 700 apprentices 
They're in the process of changing their future trajectory of their life. And I'll share with you a story of just one student, Anjanique, who works at Pinnacle Assurance, a work comp insurance provider in our state with over 600 employees. And she had been in an online school in Aurora when she heard about apprenticeship. And I asked her, she had now completed two years of her apprenticeship, how has apprenticeship changed her view of her future? And Anjanique said, after thinking a moment, is honestly, I didn't think I had a future before my apprenticeship at Pinnacle. But what I've learned is I have value, that I can in fact contribute to the success of this company and in turn they've given me an opportunity I could not have imagined. Anjani graduated from her apprenticeship this summer. She is on her way to get a two-year degree, possibly a four-year degree paid for by Pinnacle. She was hired by them and now makes a living wage right out of high school and is continuing her education. So for Pinnacle, who now has over 5% of their workforce as apprentices, it's changing the nature of their business, how they train and develop employees. And for a company that four years ago had the same requirement that you had to have a four-year degree, that no longer exists in their employee handbook because they recognize talent comes in many forms. And if we're gonna deal with the issues of inequality in our country, we need a system that serves all of our people. An apprenticeship, you can start with an apprenticeship and end with a PhD. It's not a limiter, it actually expands opportunity. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, start us all off with one question and then turn to some of the questions we've been getting from the audience. We have a lot of great questions, we'd love to answer as many of them as possible. Um, the question I have first for all of you is that, you know, the, the programs you describe are pretty intensive. They're time intensive, they're resource intensive, especially when you're talking about wraparound supports. And you do hear employers uh, expressing concern that they don't want to invest in a worker only to lose them to a competitor. Um, how do you address the concerns that you hear, may hear from other employers about, you know, poaching um, or losing a young person that they've invested so much time and energy into? I mean, you know, no, it, maybe you want to start there? It's interesting. When we were on our trip in Switzerland, I remember one of the participants, somebody asking that question, and a gentleman that runs one of the largest, they have about 1,000 employees here in Colorado, said, you know, people say that to me, and I answer them by saying, what if you don't train them? So the answer is, you don't really have a choice in our businesses. And if you create an education and workforce system like they have in other countries, then an apprentice may not stay with my company, but they are in a marketplace that they have the training, the experience, and the whole economic outcome for business as well as their citizens improves. So the real risk is, what happens if you don't train them? Obed, do you wanna weigh in here? What happens sure, with yeah. those apprentices? <laughs> I'd love to build on that. Um, and then one is, you know, when, when we look at our own workforce, the there are a couple of things that are characteristics of the people who are most engaged and are more retentive. That is, they are spending tons of time learning. Um, they are, uh, opportunities are created for them. So they are finding their way and they're navigating, they're getting promoted, they're working on cool projects um, and they have great mentorship. And then when you think about the elements of a good apprenticeship program. It has all of those things. So it's inherently in an engaging model. And we have seen a high level of retention of the individuals that we've invested in. So as we've invested in them, they've turned around and invested back into the firm. And it, you know, it becomes a business. So A, it's a business imperative um, uh, that we do this because we need to call, close the skills gap, but we also find that we're creating greater levels of um, um, uh, loyalty um, to the organization by investing back into these individuals. We have then worked with um, 40 other company um, organizations, right, through the Consumer Tech Association to try and share some of these models so that companies can get started, right, so um, with this particular program. So don't shy away, lean in, um, and then there's tools and capabilities that we'd love to be able to share so that um, more companies can engage in this type of um, talent model. Um, Marie and Vivek, I actually have a question for you from the audience that, that I'd love for you to weigh in on. It's from uh, Greg Miller, who's the co-founder of Health Tech Alley. He asks, there are many apprenticeship programs out there. 
what might be some of the distinguishing features of highly effective programs? Right, so <clears throat> do you want me to, this is for Maria, for me? Great, awesome. So one is, um, I would say programs that are really looking at um, expanding their pipeline for workers. So going beyond their traditional sources of talent and really looking to see how can, through their apprenticeship program, can they truly be um, expanding diversity of their workforce. And so a lot of times that means partnering with community organizations like uh, what Noel has um, in Colorado, your workforce board or other community-based organizations. So I think that's a great um, attribute. I think also looking to see how can you build connections with community colleges and other post-secondary institutions so that there can be um, some post-secondary credit attached to the apprenticeship as well. And definitely as we've heard from several folks that um, element of those support services, whether that be mentoring or other place, other um, services to really enable that folks can succeed in the apprenticeship pathway. Um, and then just one point on the prior question, I think that one benefit of apprenticeship uh, that differs from a lot of employer-sponsored training models is that ability to truly align from the very beginning on your specific um, skill needs and the competencies that you're looking for. So rather than having an individual go through you know, a, um, a program and then come to your doorstep and then having to train them, you're able to really drive that alignment up front. And I think that's really a, of a unique element of this approach that's really key, particularly in kind of the pace of how much things are changing in our labor force right now. I'd love to add to that. Um, I think the most successful apprenticeships don't see apprenticeships as a bolt on, bolt on component of hiring, but as something that's thought through end to end. So for instance, for Twilio, it meant really thinking about the hiring process. Are we assessing for skills that are actually required for the job to be done? Onboarding, are we equipping the people we have hired with skills and knowledge they effectively need to do the job done? performance reviews, are we actually assessing people for the work they're doing or have we created some level of abstraction away from that, which makes it really difficult for people to understand what they should be growing towards. And then finally, creating a true sense of culture and a community within the organization to support and champion the apprentices and also create a cohort feeling where they don't feel isolated. Those are some really important aspects for Twilio. Going back to the previous question, I always think of retention issues as a check engine light for the organization. And what I found is that our apprentices are highly sensitive to things such as toxic culture, poor management, unclear direction. So if when I hear apprentices leaving the organization, it makes me think, where in this entire process did something go wrong and how can we double down and not only improve the program, but help the broader organization improve as a whole? So I have another yeah. question. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I just add a little bit to yeah, what Maria and sure. Vivek said? Absolutely. And that is, you know, at my company, we tried to do apprenticeships for decades unsuccessfully. And what we learned and what I brought to CareerWise and what we're trying to do is build the infrastructure to make it possible to do the things that Maria and Vivek were talking about. So what does that look like? If you're doing a youth apprenticeship program, connecting with the schools, allowing approvers, creating a marketplace that's safe for students is a digital technology that we created that helps facilitate our work, whether it's in Denver or with our affiliate in New York City or DC or in Indiana. Without that, you can't make those connections. Second, developing with the input of industry what those competencies are that are trained to. It's not about seat time. It's about actually having that information by which you can train to and then a performance management system that our apprentices now use that will provide feedback to our education system in terms of data points. Here are the competencies that businesses are training for right now and here are the gaps. 
And here's where education can join in with us. So I think technology is an important piece of the infrastructure that will allow this work to scale. Otherwise, it'll be a nice program serving a few thousand young people or adults. Mm -hmm. So we have about five minutes um, left and a very long list of questions. So I'm trying to decide what to ask here. Um, but here's a question that um, goes on the uh, student side of things. You know, apprenticeship has a reputation that might be 40 years old. You know, what is the argument to students that they should think about apprenticeship as a career track and maybe not opt for the traditional, traditional four-year college route? Uh, I'll jump in here and say earn and learn. <laughs> so it was one of the, it was one I remember having this conversation with my niece because she re she read one of a recent blog of mine that was talking about apprenticeships and she was like, why didn't you tell me about this sooner? <laughs> you mean I get to earn and learn at the same time? So I think a a um a very focused on building on a modern skills and capability, continuous learning, learning modern um, skills that are directly applicable to gain um, a living wage and also a connection to a career path, that is um, that is the value prop. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I would, I think the challenge here is actually at, on two levels. So one is how do you help kind of demystify apprenticeship for those folks who are providing guidance to young people, whether they be parents or counselors or folks at a workforce board. I think too often um, there are a lot of misunderstandings about apprenticeship, even though through many presidential administrations, I think you know, there's been a lot of um, push in this area. I still think there's a lot of fundamental um, misunderstanding. So how do you make it clearer but then also, and so then I think the second level then is appealing to the individual um, themselves, right? So I think you have a system level clarification issue and then you have, how do you make that case uh, to the individual young person or worker? Um, but I completely agree that the uh, debt-free approach is definitely a, <laughs> a standout characteristic and that ability that to really integrate this right, tightly, tightly with post-secondary, that it's not an either or pathway, it can really be a combined pathway to lead to really terrific outcomes. Can I add that, uh, make a small plug for registered apprenticeship here, um, specifically, so uh, Twilio's Hatch program was first registered with the DOL through um, Tech SF, which is uh, an initiative by San Francisco Office of Economic and Workforce Development. And a really important benefit for the apprentice here is a transferable credential by the Department of Labor for a certain occupation, which moves with them after they leave the organization as well. So there is a degree of legitimacy to apprenticeship over something as just casual, like an internship or something. So when done correctly by the employer, there is an additional benefit for the learner as well. And I would add to that as well, Vivek, for the employer, many of our employers in New York City are companies like JP Morgan Chase, Amazon, Google. They do business across the country and they don't want to do business 50 different ways. And with a registered apprenticeship, there is that standard that can then be used in JP Morgan across the country or with Bank of America. And that's a real value add to building a system as opposed to just a program. And a career. And, and I think the, the having those, it, um, it is super important that we think about these um, roles, not just as um, jobs, but as a pathway to a career. When we have digital um, credentials um, that are portable, then it puts you on a path to a career, which is why we've registered all of um, our 24 different apprenticeships as well. So final question. Um, very quickly, we're about to hear from policymakers who are championing apprenticeships. What is the one thing that you would like Congress administration to do on apprenticeships? So Maria, let's start with you and just go down the line and then we're going to turn it over to Richard. 
Yeah, so I, I'd say pass the National Apprenticeship Act of 2021 um, would be my headline. You know, I think um, funding is really needed to help take this model to scale. Um, we can do a lot of tinkering around the edges without funding, but I think the boost of resources would really help take this uh, to the next level. Noel, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, years ago, I worked with Governor Romer and sat on the, the National Governors Association Roundtable on School to Career. Billions were spent. Money was poured into billions to something that never sustained itself. So the advice I would give is really twofold. Make the investment in the infrastructure that makes this possible. And that infrastructure is beyond just our universities and our community colleges and our K-12 system, although they're critical. It's also in the industry intermediaries that need to be a long-term player in this work that will define the competencies, the technologies that will support this. And then remember at the end of the day, if industry doesn't do this, this is a wonderful idea that other countries are able to implement. So how we engage with legislation to support the startup costs for this work, not to sustain or pay wages, but to help train their, their coaches, their supervisors and their HR departments to support something like this is essential. So let's not spray and pray with lots of money. Let's be very strategic. Um, I'm not intimately familiar with the act, but my main ask is to really invest in the infrastructure that glues learners, institutions or trainers and employers. Right now, there's a lot of goodwill from organizations and employers that want to hire apprentices, but are unable to invest or offer scholarships. Uh, there might be a skill mismatch between uh, what organizations are training individuals on and what they need. And we need a nexus that brings together these different players and also funds programs appropriately uh, to create the ecosystem that this country currently lacks that as we rightly pointed out, many others do have. I know that you had the last word. <laughs> so um, since my colleagues here have already talked to very specific programs, I'm gonna say, the tenacity to stick at this particular topic over the long horizon. It doesn't get fixed overnight and it needs the partnership of industry, education and government and policymakers over a long horizon. We are at the um, cusp of you know, really diversifying, changing the way that we're thinking about workforce transformation day the course, <laughs> be tenacious, and then you know continue to grow our apprenticeship programs and the policies that enable those programs. Terrific. A huge thank you for all of our panelists and thank you to everyone out there for joining us. I'm going to turn things over now to Richard Reeves of Brookings Institution. Thank you, Anne. And thank you for moderating that panel. Just absolutely fascinating. And they've given some marching orders to, uh, to our next two guests who are I hope we'll be joining us now. Uh, I think we've heard the word timely mentioned quite a few times. Um, and I think it's therefore a great moment for us to have this, this conversation. Um, so I'm delighted to, to mention um, two of those who are kind of in the, in the thick of it uh, in terms of legislating on this issue of apprenticeships. Um, we're going to hear from Senator John Hickenlooper, who is the junior Senator for Colorado, having won election uh, to that office last year, but no stranger to public office, having also served as the governor of Colorado and before that as the mayor of Denver. And he's also a businessman. In fact, both of our final guests are businessmen, uh, having co-founded a brew pub in Denver called the Wincoop, which to this day sponsors the annual Beer Drinker of the Year competition. I think that's right, Senator? Yes. That's great. Well, I'd love to talk about that, but I suspect we won't have time, but a businessman <laughs> as well as a politician. Uh, and then we're going to hear from Representative David McKinley, who is the U.S. Representative for West Virginia's first congressional district. Uh, he, too, speaks as both a member of Congress and as a, bus a businessman, in fact, the founding owner of a successful engineering company uh, in West Virginia. I think it's also important to note uh, in the context of this debate that he has been supportive of the National Apprenticeship Act, 
um, and one of the, one of the relatively few numbers of Republicans, I think, thus far, who have been largely supportive. And so we'll we'll get into that, um, I'm sure, in this brief conversation. But let me just start by thanking both of you for your precious time uh, on such a such an important issue uh, for joining us. So great to have you both here. So let's let's dive straight in. Um, Obvious apprenticeships are one of those issues, particularly in the US, it seems to me, where the proportion of warm words of enthusiasm to actual legislation is particularly high. That's true generally, but perhaps no more so than here. We do now have some legislation that's uh, in place um, that's potentially proceeding. Um, I'm just going to ask each of you, what do you think have been the main barriers thus far to making progress, especially bipartisan progress, which I think we could all agree is essential in this area? Um, or at least desirable, uh, and how far does the, the bill um, go in terms of addressing those historic barriers to progress? Senator Hickenlooper, let's start with you. Sure, and I'll, uh, again, that's a, that's a 30 minute question. Uh, you have three minutes. <laughs> all right, exactly. Uh, so I got involved and Noel Ginsburg, who was just on your previous panel, came to me uh, about eight years ago, seven and a half years ago, and, and described the problems he was having finding him you know, the, uh, a well-trained, sufficiently ready uh, workforce. And you, he began this process that led to career-wise while I was governor. And I saw firsthand the appetites that's there, the necessity in terms of allowing our economy to grow and how genuinely bipartisan the issue should be. Uh, and I think that the, the act that, that we're all discussing uh, is a great step. I don't think it's, it gets everything done that we want to get done. But, you know, I mean, one of the problems historically has been that as a country, we did such a great job of, of convincing every young person they should go to college. Uh, and I think the consequences of that are self-evident. Uh, a lot of kids went to college but didn't graduate. They ended up with a lot of debt. Uh, I mean, we've got 70% of, of our young people that graduate from high school don't go to college, don't, aren't going to get a college degree. And yet they're going to be essential to whether we can innovate and continue to grow our economy. And it's not just technology. Well, that's, that's part of it. It's, it. it's about hospitals and advanced manufacturing, like what Noel does. Uh, it is everything you can imagine under the sun. And it's not going to be just apprenticeship for 17, 18 year olds. It's going to be apprenticeships all throughout life. I think we're going to go through these waves of innovation and, and, and automation, and we're going to have waves of people at risk of losing their careers. I, you know, I have a, had a master's in geology, came out to Colorado in, the, in 1981. I had a company car. I thought I'd be a geologist for my whole life. But there was a long recession in the mid-'80s. Our company got sold. I got laid off along with 10,000 other geologists. And so I ended up not opening just, not just opening one brew pub, which is the greatest thing one can do in life to a certain extent, outside of having children. Uh, but I also opened a whole bunch of brew pubs and other restaurants and I built a career out of that. Uh, I was lucky. Most of the, or many of those geologists had a, a struggle when they had to reinvent themselves and learn new skills. And I think this apprenticeship approach allows us to look at skills training from a whole new light on the job learning where people are getting paid while they're learning. And I think it has the potential, and this, I think this act is a great start to really solve a, a major challenge in this country. Thank you. Congressman McKinley, I'm gonna to come to you. Um, you obviously, you have a long track record of interest in, in these issues. Um, can you speak a little bit to what you think the barriers have been thus far and how far oh. you think that this bill goes? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think uh, one of the, things I would agree with with the senator is that we had over the years, uh, uh, I think our, our, for, our forefathers were, gave us some bad advice. And that was that we all ought to go to college. Everyone ought to go to college. And so the curriculums all across America all got structured that way. And when we talk to the schools today, we're finding out they have very few people going to the vocational education program. There's a stigma associated with that. So we've got to get past the stigma. And that also applies, I, I see a very parallel relationship in the apprenticeship program for people that, let's look at it. Let's, let's give that consideration. Now, Richard, I, I come at, I, I wasn't opening bars and restaurants. I, I was opening construction companies and building buildings. Uh, 
uh, and I've been doing this since '65. Think about that. Uh, you know, I've got, I got, I've got, I've got some gray hairs as a result of doing that. And, but one of the things that we really come to appreciate in the building trades is using their apprenticeship program, and we see the advantage. But we also knew that they had to break out of their what they had been taught that anyone that was going to be going to be a carpenter or electrician, there must be something wrong with them. Maybe there's there's a deficiency. So we got to get past that because for us to build a good, strong middle class, we have to have people willing to work with their hands. And so we've been working on this for years uh, on this. I've uh, all through my construction career before coming to Congress it was all structured around uh, supporting our apprenticeship programs. In the West Virginia, we have a vibrant, uh, very, very robust program. And I think what I'm hoping through this legislation, we can use the construction as the model of how we can spread that out to other uh, uh, other segments of our economy because it's worked very well in construction. Well, I just, of course, I'll just observe, of course, that bars are usually in buildings, so there is a harmony between uh, between your work. But can we talk a bit, a little bit, just about how the politics of this plays out? Because we've heard from the panel before how important it is to have a consistent uh, policy architecture, right? What you, this is not an area. There are a few areas of policy where you want lots of changes all the time. But this is one that really needs long-term commitment, and that does speak to bipartisanship. Can you speak a little bit, Congressman, to what the concerns are, perhaps on your side of the aisle, and um, with the current act, the current bill, and the approach, and, and in order to try and build more of a bipartisan consensus? You know, what is it? What is it that's, well, that's leading many of your colleagues to not wish to support this legislation? I, I, a lot of it, uh, and. Well, let me let me back up and start again on this. I think a lot is because they, there's a misunderstanding of what this does. Uh, uh, because typically, uh, the apprenticeship programs have been through union affiliated groups, uh, and I've got to, I've, I, I'm going to try to educate the members on on my side of the aisle that this has it, it it's not the the building trades maybe apply that, but if we're going to go into aerospace or we're going to do high tech and other, we need workforce. I think. The best tool I've got to be able to go forward with this is reinforcing how when they talk to their manufacturer, they talk to their employers back in their district. I got to I feel very comfortable that the overriding notation that they get from that is that where do I get my workforce? Where is my workforce for tomorrow? And if they so putting aside, this is not union or non-union. This is just there's a workforce shortage. How do we do it? How do we fill this thing in? So I'm the. Uh, I'm the 10th most bipartisan member of Congress. I think I, what a hoot that is uh, uh, the, to emerge it because I understand it's not black or white and it's not red or blue. These are ways that we can talk together and I'm gonna work on that. I'm gonna use that influence of whatever I've developed over the last 11 years to try to develop relationships where we can spread that concept of the construction apprenticeship program to all these other sectors because every one of them is telling us we've got we don't have a workforce so well i think we've all noticed the concentration of political power in west virginia uh, in recent years uh, congressman so my power to your elbow but um senator hickenlooper you've been around this issue a long time and you've looked at it from various perspectives it does feel as as if as a congressman just suggested that to those who aren't close to this debate it sort of boils down to whether you're on the side of unions or on the side of employers right um, and, and so they, these, some people have this attachment. They think French is a union. We want more employer involvement. That's one of the reasons why Annalise, I think, led this event to be around employer involvement, right? Because I think that there's this strong agreement that employer involvement is required. Is, is that a correct characterization of some of the barriers here? And, and what do you think about um, the prospects in the Senate and how will you kind of help to sh shepherd this through the Senate? Well, and, and first let me tell David that um, I agree with him that we've got to have people working with their hands. Uh, it's an essential part of this country. My older brother, Sydney, is a uh, automobile mechanic. So he had me rebuilding my first Chevy 283 when I was 18 years old. Uh, there is a joy to understanding how things go together and how they work. Uh, and at least all, I mean, it really does help you go and understand how nature works, how systems work, how business works. Uh, in terms of the politics, um, I'm from the school that, that, you know, as we train people in skills, they have a choice whether they want to organize and, and form a, a labor union or not. And if the aerospace workers want to have a union or if the 
You know, if the, the tech workers in Silicon Valley feel they're not getting a, a fair shot and they want to organize, so be it. I think people should have that right to organize. The, the skills training shouldn't have anything to do with that. Skills training should recognize that these are great jobs. And, and I think, again, as I built these restaurants and most of them were in old warehouses and we renovated the whole building and the lofts and mixed use projects. And I spent most of my time with the, the carpenters and the plumbers and the electricians, just cause I kind of liked, I liked that the relationships uh, became uh, deeper for me in a lot of ways. And that experience of building things and, and, and having it come together, I understand exactly what, what David's talking about of, of the, that is, a natural inclination of people. What does Democrat or Republican have to do with that? The, the, you know, in many ways, the as we build things and, and whether those things are aerospace systems or a brew pub, uh, it, it, we're, it's the same thing. We're actually taking what's there, we're, we're organizing and investing ourselves and some capital into it, and we're creating jobs. Uh, this, you know, this is what makes country's great uh, and succeed. Uh, anyway, I think that's, yeah. I, 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 I will look forward to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to chair the employment, the employment and workplace safety subcommittee on the health education and labor committee in the, in the Senate. And I really look forward to discussing this bill with Republicans and Democrats, because I think it should be not unlike infrastructure, it should be a place where we can get an alignment of, of, of self-interest and alignment of effort. So um, there is this potential to depoliticize the issue somewhat and become more bipartisan. Is striking someone coming from Europe to the US that there is a very different brand to apprenticeships um, in the US. And I agree with what both of you have said around the stigma of this. It's very often something that people are thinking about for other people's children rather than their own. It's very often seen as something which is a, you know, not, not seen as a, a credible alternative to to college. Have either of you seen any examples though from overseas? I know actually, you know, I think we've just heard Senator, that you were in Switzerland. Um, and is there anything we can learn from the from what other countries have done? I'll start with you, Senator Hickenlooper. Well, just real quickly, I, and you heard that Noel Ginsburg organized and we took 50 people. We had the CEOs of 10 of the largest companies. We had the superintendents of school districts, foundations, the head of higher education, the head of K-12 education. We had everybody for a whole week. There's only one time in my eight years as mayor, eight years as governor, where I spent a whole week doing one thing, and that was exploring the apprenticeship system in, in Switzerland. And, you know, it's very similar to Sweden and Norway. I mean, they're, what it allows, allows kids to make their own decision. Government isn't telling them which way they've got to go. So it is perfectly suited to an American uh, implementation. But I think it's also worth pointing out that the, the, the largest bank in Europe, UBS, their CEO started out as an apprentice. He didn't get his, his, his college degree until he was in his 20s. He got to decide and mold his life. Uh, is, he, is he blue collar? Is he white collar? I mean, now he's the CEO of the largest bank in, in, in Europe. That allows, this apprenticeship model allows people to construct their lives as they want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Congressman McKinley, yeah, any thoughts from, can we learn from abroad on this that, that we can bring home to America? Well, yeah, other nations uh, don't stigmatize uh, uh, this like we do for some reason. We just got to get past that. Um, so it's not so much I'm going to learn from from other nations uh, that that may be there may be something in Germany particularly uh, has a has a very robust program there. But I'm also saying, I, I think we can break through some barriers by talking on on a, a pocketbook, a, a wallet issue. Here it is that. You can say to someone, if you go into the apprenticeship program, you're going you're gonna to come out of that, uh, much like vocational education, you're going to come out of that with uh, maybe making $70,000, $80,000 a year and zero debt as compared to going to college for four years and having a degree uh, on uh, French literary studies uh, that you might have, a, or geology that John did when he went out to Colorado to find out there's not a rigged market for that, perhaps. Uh, but uh, why are we struggling? Let's let's show people in a pocketbook they, they can make money at this and a lot of money and instantly with it. And because you, as most apprentices, again, the mo one I'm most familiar with has been the construction trades that they're they're working at the same time they're earning money while they're going to school. So it it has some great advantages to it, but 
I haven't seen as much as maybe John was talking about others. I haven't seen the attachment yet, the union, non-union, uh, not from the real world, but I do hear it from the members here. When I talk to other members of Congress about embracing this concept, their mainly their reaction is this union. I, I'm trying to explain to them it has nothing to do with it. This is being able to have workforce in all aspects of what we need to build this economy uh, as it comes back out of this pandemic. We're going to need people uh, available quickly. Uh, so I like this. I, I like the idea of making sure we teach them first. Doesn't cost you anything. You're, you're going to earn a big, a good living. Something that you can, you can, uh, you can buy a house with. You can buy a car or a truck or whatever with it right away. You're not and, you're, and with no debt. I, I want to make sure people understand that aspect of, of the apprenticeship program. Yeah, because I, I, again, I think you're right. I have noticed that people make that connection immediately. And it's also striking that even as people become more aware of the costs of college and the potential uh, lower returns in some cases to college, the policymaker solution is to make college free and write off everybody's debt rather than encourage alternatives, um, which I think speaks, it speaks to just how strong this grip uh, is of the idea of college. But I want to ask you both another question because I, I think one of the reasons for some resistance to this kind of thing in the US may have a slightly more understandable cause, if you like, which is the concern about tracking, particularly in high school. So I, the evidence suggests that the earlier you start giving people vocational opportunities in high school, and certainly thereafter, the better. But in the US, the idea of public high schools, the idea of tracking, the idea of saying to someone, you know, even when they're still in high school, let alone when they're 18, right, you're going down that track is very problematic in the US, partly because of its history around race, but it's largely unproblematic in Europe, right? It's like, what are you good at? What do you wanna do? And it's integrated into the, high, into the system. Can you speak a little bit to whether that's correct, that there is still this concern about tracking people too early and that that has inadvertently led to a devaluation of vocational training, particularly in the early years. Congressman, do you mind starting with you on that? Uh I don't, I've never, I, I, I'm aware that there was a tracking issue. I didn't, I never experienced it uh, back in the 60s. Uh, maybe it's more prevalent now, but again, it's, we've started phasing away from the vocational education. Uh, I, I, I don't like those kinds of studies or, or tests given to someone to find out you're going to be better as a carpenter than you would be going. I don't, I don't like it because some people never just, they don't test right. Uh, they're going to have to, it's going to have to evolve. So I, maybe I can learn from what they've done in Europe, but uh, I, I, I want people to make that call when they're ready to make that call to do that. I, I didn't decide I wanted to be a, a, a structural engineer until I was a junior in high school. Uh, and it was only because that's all I, my father was a structural engineer. And I, if he was good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Uh, and, and so I followed in that path. Um, but uh, I could very well, if he had been a carpenter, I might have been a, become a carpenter. Uh, yeah, I think some people would say it's quite don't, early. But... Don't, don't, don't let these tests tell you what you're, what you're supposed to be good right. at. So you're talking about choice and flexibility rather than yes. determination. Yes. I think the fear is that somehow the state or the school or sort of just labels people, right? And it says, well, well you're, you're, not, you're good I, with I, your hands. It's just a polite way of saying you're not smart enough for college. That's the fear, right? Th th yes, that, that may be true. And I think, but it's, again, it's, I think the biggest pushback I'm hearing more is, is not the not the uh, uh, tracing it's it's more who's going to pay for this and again I come from the construction industry the car the carpenters the plumbers the electricians they pay for that themselves there's a portion of their salary all goes towards the apprenticeship program so the projects uh, the the employers and the employee they pay for it and then the employee pays for it so it's not a government program they, they get some federal money yes of course they do it's some I think in West Virginia, it's uh, something less than $2 million a year, but we're running, what, 29, 30 different programs all over West Virginia. A couple million dollars isn't what's running those programs. It's the people themselves realize they, they want to make sure they're trained for the job. So I, I want to make it, don't look at this as not a federal program. This is no. something that's going to be done with our employees. Right, but it, so there's a role for federal government, but it's a market and it's driven by demand in the yes. end by the people who want that's, it. And that's it, and, it, and, it, and it works, good. All right, um, uh, Senator Hickenlooper, any thoughts on kind of the general framing of vocational and also just your hopes for this going forward? I think a congressman seems uh, pretty optimistic that the tide is turning a little bit and committed to his education program, which is great. What about your thoughts in terms of what we should see over the next few years? 
Well, two things I want to just offer different perspectives. Uh, he was talking about the, the benefits to these workers that they, they can buy a, a truck, they can get a, get a house. I mean, they can get a start on their life in, in a way sooner. But I think more important is to see that, that there are waiting lists for businesses that want to hire these apprenticeships, these, these apprentices. And that's why you, you, you in West Virginia, we, as, as the representative said, $2 million for all these programs all across the state, it's a very low cost. I mean, the, the, the government money is really the convening. And in essence, it's like these businesses are raising their hands saying, I want to pay more taxes. In other words, they realize the importance of getting a workforce with the skills and the preparation that, that they can really do what's needed and you know grow into the job successfully. I think that's a big part of what's so going to be so attractive that we we don't need to have a, a fifty billion dollar or even a ten billion dollar program. We can facilitate the opportunity for for kids to make this decision, and that's that's the second. That's what why tracking and 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 putting someone on the wrong track or the right track and which has the right brand. Uh, and I do agree with a lot of what David said that that there has been a a a a, a you know a smudge. You know, it's, it's somehow not as good to have to work with your hands as it is to go to college, which is nonsense. I mean, my, again, my brother, automobile mechanic, uh, you know, has had a great, wonderful life. Uh, I think kids, and I would say kids of all ages, but, but especially in, in you know, uh, 16, 17, 18 year olds, right in there, as they come into high school, they should have the choice. And I, you know, when I ran for mayor of Denver, I was struck by the, the school district being separate from city government, the superintendent of schools and the mayor, they didn't see each other too much. There's a whole long reason for that. But I made the promise if I got elected mayor in my first term, I'd visit every every school in Denver. And nobody told me until after the election there were 161 schools in Denver. So I, I went and spent two hours in a, in a public school every week for my first four years in office. And I can tell you in the high schools, I saw a lot of kids in class just bored silly, twiddling their thumbs. Right. They were looking at things they didn't care about. They were waiting to get their high school diploma. The great thing about the apprenticeship program is they can go out and be working two days a week when they start, then three days a week the second year, four days a week the third year, something along those lines. But in the other days when they're not working, they go back to high school right. or in their second or third years, they can go to community colleges. So and, and in, in Colorado, they we have concurrent enrollments so they can accrue credits. If they want to switch and go on to college, they'll have credits to th towards that. But but they get to make the choice. They end up with a college degree. Over three years, they'll make almost $30,000. They'll have you know, uh, uh, some college credits that they want to, but most importantly, they're gonna have a sense of, of where they wanna go in life. And I think yeah. that allowing them the choice and making sure that there's equity, that we are providing this opportunity to every neighborhood, every community in the city so that, that, that every uh, racial barrier is broken down, that, that everyone gets a fair shot at at learning apprenticeships, that's going to do a lot to open up. People are going to look at this, I right. think, and say, yay, this is a much, you know, in many ways, yeah. this is a better path for me to take. Well, well having, having graduated two sons through U.S. high schools, I agree that the final year doesn't necessarily seem to be packed with productivity. Um, <laughs> so I strongly agree with that. And what I, hear, what I hear you saying, I hear the congressman saying that, you know, people are putting their hands up and saying, I want the skills, I, need, I want the skills to get a good job. And I don't think I should need to go to college to do that. And I hear you saying, Senator, but employers are putting their hands up and saying, I need the skilled workers to be able to make a profit and be successful uh, in this market. Um, and so it's a, we're up against time. It's a, it's a cliche in policy circles to say, if not now, then when. But maybe less of a cliche for this issue right now as we come out of COVID. Um, and so we'll all be watching this space um, very, very closely. And to thank both of you for your advocacy in this area um, and for your work on this legislation. Um, I also want to thank my colleague, Annalise Goga, who is absolutely the lead for Brookings on this. They're doing terrific work in this area. And to all of my colleagues who've helped put this together and our previous panelists. Uh, and of course, the AV Tech, Harold and Trevor, who have been behind the scenes making all of this possible. Um, in this remote space. And with that, thank you for all of you who are watching for joining us and your questions um, and be safe, be well. Thanks again. Thank you. Be safe, be safe. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.